thank you so much. Um, I'm terribly sorry about the technology, everyone. And uh, I, uh, I'm sorry I'm not able to join you in Barcelona uh, this afternoon. Um, but it is a pleasure to join uh, uh, all of you with uh, UOC. And, and thank you also to, uh, to Ciro for, for the kind invitation. I just wanted to set out three things uh, for the conference this afternoon, three thoughts that may well uh, support what you're doing uh, in Barcelona today and tomorrow and, and, and over the past couple of days. But before I do, I just wanted to spend a few moments setting out why all of this matters. Uh, sometimes those of us who are involved in digital transformation, in IT, in uh, online learning, we sometimes get hugely absorbed in uh, very important aspects, you know, the business models that we're discussing this afternoon. We sometimes forget why we're talking about this in the first place, why we're passionate about this sector, and why we're passionate about ensuring that we extend the opportunity of success to more students around the world. And I think there are uh, two or three really important reasons why we should be focusing on this and why what all of us do, why all of you uh, in the room there in Spain, why all of that is so paramount, not only to students, not only to our universities, not only to access to students around the world, but also to our economies and the opportunities of people uh, right across the planet. And as we've seen in uh, recent months, the need for people to feel a greater connection to their society, the need for people to feel ownership, the need for people to feel that they have opportunity to succeed and prosper is more important than ever before. So what are a few of those reasons? The first is simply the digital and technological revolution that we're seeing right across the planet. Just look back and think back to 10 years ago when we didn't have Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or Google. What was life like in a world like that? When we spent more time with our phones to our ears than looking at the phone as we so often do today. When we didn't have these weapons of mass distraction that though I can't see you today, I know people are, are tapping on and typing on and tweeting on uh, as we speak. But crucially also a world where conventional businesses, conventional industries were completely shaken up. And when you think about the business models in this sector, when you think about uh, where supply and demand is moving, where you think about where investment is moving, you can see some really significant trends. Let me give you a few examples. Amazon, offered Borders Books a deal uh, right back when Jeff Bezos first started uh, Amazon. And uh, Borders Books declined that, that offer. Today, uh, Borders Books has filed for bankruptcy in the past three or four years, and Amazon is now worth over $90 billion. Blockbuster, we used to rent our DVDs there, certainly in the UK and also in many parts of Europe. Today, they didn't realize they did that Netflix and Love Film and others would come and disrupt their industry. And that is causing a significant impact to entertainment, to gaming, to society. And today, Borders Books, far from bankruptcy, again, Netflix and Love Film, where people tend to, con uh, to, to consume so much entertainment in their daily lives. And another example that I always find staggering, but when Neil Armstrong stepped foot onto the moon, he took that iconic photograph with a Kodak film. Today, Kodak didn't realize that digital coming was going to disrupt their industry and they filed bankruptcy four years ago. So incredible shifts in so many conventional industries, many more that we can all think of, banking, travel, hotels, a whole range of others. But also then the need for us to think about what that is then going to do to our education system. What is that going to do to our higher education system? And what lessons do we need to learn both thinking about the differences, but also thinking about some of the parallels in our own world, which of course has been so conventional. And that's what we've been doing in the UK, of course, with what colleagues, I'm sure there are a few there from the Open University, what we did over the past uh, six years, what we certainly tried to do with FutureLearn, the MOOC platform, Europe first uh, MOOC platform, uh, which I know you've just been talking about in the agenda, but now increasingly what we're doing with KeyPath and various other models. So let me walk you through, perhaps, as, as we're keen to do, I think, in this session, walk you through some of those disruptions, walk you through some of those industries. I think we are seeing, certainly uh, in terms of what we do, online enabling, that there has been an explosion in the interest uh, from European universities. We started doing this uh, about 16 years ago in the United States, 
and have worked with dozens of universities, uh, particularly in, in, that, in that part of the world. But you then saw uh, what happened in the US around 10 years ago, moving into Australia, very similarly to what happened uh, with MOOCs. And we began in Australia around three years ago, and we've seen the most extraordinary demand, not only from their universities to enter these online enabling partnerships, but also from students around the world who said that, you know, I've got my job, I've got my kids, I've got a whole range of other challenges in my daily life, but I want access to a great university in the US, in Australia, but now increasingly in Europe. And this is an opportunity that our universities have today to not only extend access and create more opportunities for students who we otherwise would not be able to reach, but also to retain our competitive edge, to retain our position at the vanguard of the world when it comes to high quality higher education. And what we've seen in perhaps the last two or three years is a lot of movement towards delivering more free courses online. Uh, I was delighted to see that Oxford University, uh, four years actually after I first sat down with, with Andy Hamilton, the child writer at the time, to talk about FutureLearn, have now uh, joined a MOOC platform for, uh, to begin launching courses. They made that announcement uh, on Tuesday of this week. But now our institutions have increasingly reached out and said, okay, formal degree programs are great. Uh, uh, sorry, formal degree programs are great on campus, but I need to think about how I execute, how I move that, how I translate into an online domain. And yes, yes, three courses are wonderful. Yes, short, short courses are great. Yes, informal experiences are really, really helpful, as I'm sure we've just been talking about in the earlier session. But what I really need are real formal, uh, usually postgraduate degree programs, uh, real revenue on my balance sheet, and real student numbers uh, from students around the world. And I think another driver here is not only innovation, how do I make sure I learn the lessons of other industries? How do I make sure I recognize the digital revolution? How do I make sure I'm doing what I need for students and everything that needs to happen in terms of blended and flipped learning in the classroom, but also what can what I do to extend access to students around the world who might not have the opportunity to engage in my content in a face-to-face -face formal environment? And alongside all of those motivations, I think there is one other that is, that is crucially important, which is that demand and supply are shifting in quite fundamental ways. If you look at um, where students still want to study in the world, it is these conventional established higher education sectors. But when you then uh, correspond that with the major parts of the world where you've seen real growth, in terms of uh, the economy or in terms of the labor market or in terms of uh, the supply side in terms of uh, you know the movement of labor it is absolutely in some of those fast growing economies of the world that might not have established higher education systems and therefore that creates a responsibility on all of us all of us here in the uk all of us in that room in spain today whereby we have to make sure that we reconcile the challenge of supply and demand how do you create additional supply for those parts of the world where demand is simply booming? And we cannot simply do it, do it through building more campuses or conventional face-to-face -face models. We've tried that and it works to an extent, but it will never meet the sort of demand that we now see. And that is why I think increasingly, in terms of business models that, that we've been discussing in this, in this uh, session, the online enabling model is becoming, I think, of much greater interest in Europe, just as it has done in the US and Australia uh, over the past decade or so. And so if I just walk you through very quickly, uh, I know a lot of uh, the delegates in the room, I've seen the list, have been interested in this. The way that the model essentially works is that the university continues to do what it is extraordinarily good at, what many of the universities in the room have probably been doing for centuries. Um, so the university essentially takes care of all of the academic elements of the course, uh, providing the content and making sure that it is driving uh, the delivery of that teaching and learning. But essentially, I think these partnerships where you bring the private sector in to provide the services, to provide the solutions, to provide the expertise that's often required for our universities are increasingly important. And we do that in four areas. 
And I think this model, and there are many others that do this too, um, is, is, is a really, really fascinating one, where we, where we essentially take care of four, four core elements. The first is the course design. Our universities are brilliant at pioneering new ways of teaching and learning, particularly on campus, at creating groundbreaking uh, research discoveries that have to then translate into our teaching and learning. But it's our instructional designers who are then able to design a high quality online course because we all know that the pedagogic underpins thing, the way in which that uh, course translates to an online domain, the way in which we think about all of the analytics that need to be analyzed um, for an online course, essentially that partnership becomes very important. And so course design is the first element that I think the private sector can play a major role in supporting institutions with as they increasingly move into an online space. The second is marketing. Now, marketing is, you know, something that our universities are very good at. Um, they know how to, you know, segment the market and they know how to understand different personas, know how to get out of students around the world. But I think the crucial factor when it comes to online learning is that the demographics of these students is so profoundly different to what we're used to within a conventional face-to-face, -face, three year away from home, 18 year old going to campus. And that means that we really have to think carefully uh, and in great detail about what do we define a student as. Our conventional model is all great and it will continue to be uh, the dominant model for the system, for our sector. And you know, there are a lot of people who have a lot of hyperbole in the space and not one of them. Right? Face-to-face -face campuses will still be the main mode of study. We're not gonna sell our campuses and turn them into shopping centers. Right? We're still gonna have those um, those core conventional models of delivery. However, you have an adult population today that is increasingly needing online higher education. And it needs for a whole range of reasons. The need to upskill, the need to reskill, the need for, for taxi drivers to look at a new, uh, a new career because you know, driverless cars will come and disrupt our conventional industries. Lifelong learning has to be at the heart of how we design and how we deliver and how we create new learning experiences. And of course, I think the private sector can play a big role in marketing to those sorts of students. Our average age today uh, with KeyPath uh, enabled courses is 39. 91% of our students are in work whilst they're studying. This is a very different cohort to what we're traditionally used to with on-campus students. The third area is, um, is recruitment. And it's crucially important that our universities have access to that world-class recruitment uh, and are able to bring those students through. And I think the high touch intensity that's required to support a student through, uh, through one of these experiences is hugely important. And therefore, uh, making sure that we have really high touch experiences where students are supported through uh, their recruitment process is very, very important. I think, again, the private sector can play a role in both the bandwidth that's required there, but also some of the really high quality uh, customer, customer experience, if you like, and I tend to prefer talking about the student experience, but just given what we're talking about here in terms of business models, the, the, the need to make sure that is optimized, the need to make sure that is highly responsive. Um, again, I think the, the recruitment challenge can be taken on by the private sector. And the final is student support. Our universities are world class in Europe at supporting students uh, through their teaching and learning. You know, we've got a whole range of new metrics in the UK from uh, the key information sets to the teaching excellence framework to the National Student Survey, and a whole range of others that get collected for organizations like HESA and others. But making sure that we're able to support online students in a way which recognizes that they have different challenges and different issues that may be going on in their daily lives is hugely important. And so, you know, making sure, for instance, that there is, a, there is one person that these students can go to is hugely important. Making sure that they know the email address and the name and the contact number of their student support advisor, again, is hugely important. And I think that in terms of retention, one of the big questions that all of us get who are passionate about online learning, that again is supported by the fact that if you have really high quality really highly personalized student support it really helps retention it really helps the student experience and it helps us to tell a story 
that actually this isn't about online being over here and face to face being over here. It's about all methods, all modes of study, all range of uh, supply side opportunities being used to transform the lives of students around the world. And I'll just end very quickly with a couple more uh, thoughts, thoughts for the group uh, in the room there today. The first is that I think we've got to think about the relationship between the corporate world, between the business world, and our conventional higher education sector. All of us are worried about employability. All of us are worried about how we uh, ensure that uh, our students are more employer ready, are, are more workplace ready. But why don't we think more about stitching those two worlds together? Think more about innovation uh, through online higher education and other routes, but think about that alongside the challenge we have around employability. And we're very, very excited about building corporate partnerships into our university partnerships around the world. And I think that's perhaps something we can get into in, in the question and answer. I just want to finish with, um, with a catchphrase that we used to like at the Open University, but I think remains as relevant uh, today as it did a few years ago, which is that we really have to ensure that we don't create a competition between conventional modes of delivery and the one that we're all passionate about, more enthused by sometimes in terms of online delivery. And my, my simple, I suppose, request and my simple message for the group today is that we have great teaching online. And sometimes we have to accept that we have lousy teaching online from some providers, from some parts of the world. But we also have great teaching in the face-to-face -face domain. And sometimes, yes, we have lousy teaching in the face-to-face -face domain. And therefore, what we have to essentially get to is simply great teaching, where the mode of study, where the way that we deliver that experience almost fades into the background. It becomes less relevant. But what we focus on is the student experience. I think all of us can see the need to deliver more for those students around the world who cannot travel, who may not be able to get a visa to come to Europe, who might not be able to afford to come to Europe, who might not be able to uh, leave their children or leave their job in whichever part of the world they're in. But by delivering really high quality experiences, by looking really creatively at how the private sector can work with our university sector, by looking and really thinking through the sorts of courses and the, really, uh, and the way that we should deliver that student experience, by looking at the course afresh and trying to make sure that that can work in new and creative ways, all of those things can help us deliver not only for our universities across Europe, but for students around the world. Thanks very much indeed.